Okay, so this was going to be a short lecture because I'm not going into um, I'm not going into Aldo Leopold and uh, Gifford Pinchot and all those dudes. Not at this moment. Um, I'm just going to go into sort of pre-colonial European management, resource management. And I couldn't find all that much information about it. But let's see if I can get this in. Okay, so um, this is a book, A Forest Journey by John Perlin. I haven't been able to read it, but I did get to read a couple or 20 pages of it on Google Books. It sounds really interesting. So if you're interested in things like, uh, if you're interested in sort of popular science nonfiction, something like uh, Song of the Dodo, uh, Parasite Rex by Carl Zimmer, etc., it might be something you wanted to pick up. It sounds like it sounds like it it would be really interesting to read in its entirety. But it's basically looking at how wood has sort of influenced and driven civilization um, for the past thousands of years. And so we see that wood, the need for wood, sort of drove expansion out of Mesopotamia. Because if you remember back in those times, wood was used um, for a lot of things. It was used for building, it was used for firewood, which is probably the most important thing that was used for. Um, it was used for uh, boats, it was used for tools, etc. So you have this thing that you need a lot of quantities of, and as the population gets bigger, you need more and more of it. And in addition to that, you're also clearing the land for agriculture. So you're going to have to start looking outside of sort of the state boundaries and nation's boundaries for wood. And in some cases, like it came to the point where um, the deforestation was so expansive that wood was more precious or as precious or more as gold or silver. Um, there were certain types of woods that were only, uh, only saved and used for uh, the building of palaces and temples. I think it was cedar for the most part. And um, there was also, there was also sort of that, uh, that use of spatial restriction customs. So there are cases, uh, I don't think it was in Mesopotamia, but it was in a civilization close, close in time to it, where they sort of set aside wood because it was getting so rare. So they set aside uh, reserves of wood and people who went into, the, into these reserves and used the wood, chopped it down, et cetera, uh, they were fined like a ton of money. I think it was like three years worth of salary for one person. Um, so you have this idea of wood being used for everything and because it's used for everything, it becomes really rare. And you get to this point where you have forest cover sort of rising and falling with populations. So forest cover um, decreases as the population increases, as the need for more wood grows and the need for more agricultural land grows. And then you have forest cover coming back once the population sort of crashes because they took down too much wood. Um, they caused deforestation and the bad, the negative effects of deforestation, things like uh, soil erosion and drought and um, silt in the water sort of negatively affect the agricultural fields, which negatively affected the population, which positively affected the forest cover because it was able to come back once there was not as many people in the landscape. You have this sort of uh, this feedback loop between forest and populations. 
So these are two maps um, from this paper, Pond Grants et al. And they basically reconstructed habitat, cropland, and pasture land uh, back in the thousands, a thousand of years ago. So we can see up here um, about 1,200 years ago, you can see that there is a lot more agricultural land up in Europe and in South Asia than there is in Africa or in South America or in North America. And if it's white, it doesn't mean that there was nothing there. It just means that it was at too low of a rate for them to actually put it onto the map. Um, and then you can see that this increase in cropland grows in intensity um, as you go from 800, uh, 1200 years ago to 600 years ago. And you can see over here that pasture land uh, looks a little bit different, right? So you have more pasture land happening in um, Africa than it seems that is happening in Europe, even though there is some pasture land conversion occurring in Europe as well. And you can also see that it's happening in um, sort of Central Asia. And hopefully, I have my geography right, but you could think of, if you remember, if you know about Central Asia, it's got a lot of steppe habitat, it's got a lot of desert habitat, et cetera. So it would, be, it would make more sense to use, uh, to sort of have a herding lifestyle and focus on herds of animals that you can use than it would to settle down and sort of work the earth for agriculture. Um, going back to that idea, uh, forest cover, you can see that there is a decrease in forest cover in a number of European countries over the years from a thousand years ago to about 200 years ago. You can see this decrease occurring And this is just another example of that happening. So the, the image on the right assumes that an increase in technological expertise sort of made deep, more deforestation unnecessary because they were able to be more efficient with their land use. So you'll see that um, over here, you see this sort of increase in deforestation in about a thousand years ago. Uh, compared to a more um, a standard sort of reconstruction of habitat back then. So you'll see less deforestation on this image on the right and then you'll see on the left. But either way, you can see that forest cover declines throughout the years and that um, there's less and less forest as the, as the years go on. And it goes up to 1850, which is right in the middle of the imperial period. As for wildlife, I wasn't able to find too much information on wildlife. Um, so you have the extinction or extirpation of large carnivores across Europe and um, sort of reduced ranges in species and uh, decreased abundance of species. So this paper, Crees et al, 2006, sort of shows right here on the bottom graph, you can see, or the bottom set of graphs, you can see that if the line goes out of the gray boundaries, if the black line goes out of the gray boundaries, that means that there was a significant decrease or increase depending on where it is in that um, in the range of that species. So we can see that you have a decrease in the range of, I think those are oryx. Let me see. Yes, oryx. And the uh, x-axis goes to the late medieval period, 
not quite sure. Let me see if I could find it. Life, it's not that. Yeah, here we go. Late medieval period, which is goes to medieval, 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 medieval. Okay, it goes up to 1500, the year 1500. So about 500 years ago. Okay, continuing on. Um, you can see that there's also uh, declines in um, beaver populations or beaver ranges. There's declines in bears. There's declines in, um, it looks like an elk, bison. There is sort of a declining trend in most wildlife species, except for uh, the smaller species, smaller body species. Okay, so I mentioned the yes. Were these all products of deforestation, or does this take into account other factors too? Uh, so this is talking about um, this is a So this is taking into account, it's not really, it's it's take, it's take the method that they use to sort of construct these ranges and look at these declines is um, zooarchaeological zoo records. So bones, remains that they were able to find and uh, date. But uh, so this would be looking at deforestation. This would be looking at loss of habitat. This would be looking at hunting as well, or, uh, just uh, extermination for the carnivores. They, they can't really necessarily give causes for these declines, but it's a mix of those factors. Okay, so um, I mentioned the Kingswood, the Royal Forest in the last lecture, and it, you know, it, it, is a, it was a thing back then. So in the 600s, um, Forest, the idea of forest was first uh, sort of written about in um, Normandy. And forest was this like, it was a wilderness area. It wasn't forest. It wasn't always like covered with trees. Sometimes it was heathland, sometimes it was the moors, etc. But it was this idea of this wilderness area that um, was productive and could be used for uh, hunting, it could be used for wood, it could be used for all sorts of resources that you wouldn't be able to get outside of this land. So that's what they talk about in the 600s and they start thinking about sort of parceling these wilderness areas, these forests, so that they can claim the area and claim the products and the potential revenue within. Um, in 802, you got Charlemagne in, in, still in Normandy, and uh, he makes it so that the right to hunt was reserved for kings and nobility. And then in uh, 1066, you get William the Conqueror, who takes over the British Isles, and um, he brings, he's from Normandy, so he brings in this idea of only kings being able to hunt and this idea of forest and wilderness areas being a place that you sort of want to claim and protect from other people. And so he gets to this, it gets to this point where um, the common man was faced with these two types of crimes if they went into these royal forests. Uh, it's called crimes against the venison and crimes against the vert. So when you're talking about uh, venison, you're talking about uh, wildlife. You're talking about species that uh, the royalty wanted to hunt. And it wasn't all wildlife necessarily. It was focused more on 
um, noble species, noble species like uh, deer and boar, things that pe royalty wanted to hunt, not just like things that they could um, catch for food basically. And that was the kind of the most important crime. It was the more important crime. And it was around the, it was the first crime that sort of got into the books. Um, crimes against the vert or the habitat that the venison depended on came later. And that was only because they noticed that, uh, you know, if you take out the habitat, there's no more animals. So uh, these forest areas were restricted from being used for wildlife, for foraging, for wood products, for firewood, et cetera. They couldn't be cleared for um, agricultural lands. And it was this idea of productivity from these forests being most important above all else. Uh, this idea of these products from the forest, both the venison and the vert being used to gain revenue for the king. So I just have a quick question. Um, what kind of customary, customary management types do you see in this idea of the royal forest? This idea of an area set aside uh, for people to hunt in, if anyone wants to guess. Um, so did the royal forest, this idea of a royal forest actually do anything to conserve or manage resources? Um, it did. So you, if, you, if you limit the use of an area to only certain people, and for only certain things, you definitely get some management and you also get conservation of resources. The problem was that these royal forests spread. And so areas that weren't deemed legally as royal forests one year might be become royal forests the next. And so you get this uh, the spread of areas that common people aren't actually able to use. And of course that causes and that causes a lot of tension and a lot of anger um, between the common man and the royalty. So we get tensions rising because of these restrictions and this need for more agricultural land and this need for firewood and this need for um, things that the forest can provide. And this actually shows up in the conflicts that started around the Magna Carta they actually had this uh, forest charter, the Carta Foresta, that was um, present in the Magna Carta to sort of give the common man more rights to use these royal forests. And in 1215, it didn't, like it wasn't confirmed and then it led to this war between the barons and the king. And then in 1297, it was finally confirmed the Magna Carta and the Carta Foresta were confirmed. And so a lot of the royal forests weren't restricted for um, common people anymore, but there was still some limitations. And um, again, like I don't, this, is, this was me getting into medieval history and sort of medieval laws. So this is where I'm not quite sure about what's happening but I'll try to explain it the best I understand it. So in place of the royal forest, you get this thing called the forest air. And from my readings, I think the best I can explain it is that it was a type of management system that was uh, locally based. So if you know about the US Forest Service, hopefully you know that there are a number of regions that the um, Forest Service sort of divided North America, the United States, I mean, United States into. And you got regional forest office, Forest Service offices for each region, and you got different management plans for each region, um, different things that people are focusing on. 
So it seems like the forest air, there were multiple forest airs across these uh, forested areas in England, in the British Isles. And it was focused on making the forest productive. So uh, again, that revenue, um, overseeing the forest use by the common man, and then also taxing people for what they were able to get out of the forest and also finding people for, um, for going against what laws still remained on forest use. And it was presided over by justices. So judges, people who would, who would hold these courts and sort of uh, hear pleas and hear cases about forest use. But um, during this period, because of this kind of loss of this uh, royal forest concept and this increase in the use of forest airs um, and social upheavals, you get this breaking down of forest protections. And so there was mass, massive disafforestment, which means that forest that was designated as royal forest and was restricted was no longer designated as royal forest and was no longer restricted for use in the early 1300s, which led to deforestation and overuse of resources, basically. And so you end up in this period in 1500, where you have uh, basically not a lot of forests left across most of Europe, except for up here in the Northeast. Early 1900s, the British common people wanted access to open land to escape the polluted city, restricted until the rise of rambling culture with the kinder mass trespass. I'll look into that, Elise, but thank you for sending that in the chat. Um, and it definitely gives, gives more information <laughs> about something that I don't really know. Um, so takeaways. Uh, forest extension in Europe seemed to follow uh, the number of people that were on the landscape throughout history. And this can be seen elsewhere, obviously. If you have more people on the landscape, you have more deforestation because you tend to have more need for the resources that uh, in the land the forest sort of takes over. But it seems particularly clear in, the Europe, in Europe that this forest cover followed population um, abundance. Royal forests were always seen as a source of wealth and products. So it wasn't set aside for um, necessarily conservation site, like most indigenous uh, sacred sites, it was set aside for its use by certain people. And then this idea of deforestation sort of increasing during the 1300s and this uh, this um this this lack of forests across Europe by 1500 um, that might explain a lot or it might have been a factor in the reason why European countries decided to start looking overseas for more resources it might have led to colonialism so that's all I have for today um, do royal forests, although ethical, have any conservation advantages? Yeah, so they definitely did have uh, conservation advantages. Um, you have habitat that was sort of saved and set aside, um, and you have less people using it, so you definitely have uh, sort of a conservation of resources. 